Next, I would like to call upon a Network 2 coordinator, Professor Dr. Lin Chich Hong from Dennis School of Education, Aarhus University and University of Innsbruck. I've been sitting on a plane for such a long time that I feel the need to stand up. I have no curriculum anymore, but I feel if I have to sit here like this that I have an enforced didactics. Huh? And maybe it might be a good idea if I move around a bit. Um, I would like, first of all, uh, before I begin uh, what I am really supposed to talk about, uh, to say that it's uh, a great pleasure for me to be back in Bangkok. Huh? Uh, I was here in 2005. Uh, and this year is the first time that I speak to you as the coordinator of Research Network 2 on workplace learning, uh, a task I have recently taken over from Professor Bente Eikia, who I'm sure many of you in the room will remember and know and love well. Uh, I hope that you won't um, object if I take over her role <laughs> for at least uh, a while into the future. And I would like to thank also our Thai hosts, and in particular, uh, Aria Roiviti, who is not only the good spirit behind so much of what happens in the ASM LLL Hub, but she's also a member of our network, and we're very proud of that. <laughs> so, um, Research Network Workplace Learning. Uh, I've got the statistics up on the first slide. And uh, I suppose the first question would be, why have we got a research network on workplace learning? Well, you heard some of the reasons this morning. Uh, it was quite obvious in Copenhagen uh, in 2005 that one of the research networks should focus on this issue. Um, the reasons uh, arise very clearly in terms of theme and content from the early work of the ASM LLL Hub, that is things that were happening uh, in the three or four years prior to the founding of the networks. Um, but I think there's something else which is equally important. You've also heard this morning that workplace learning is quite important in policy terms for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, from a researcher's point of view, then you have to have more reasons than that for wanting to uh, do something on workplace learning. And I suppose what I would say is that um, the topic of workplace learning is theoretically interesting for researchers. It's theoretically interesting because, if you like, it decenters or deplaces adult learning. Adult learning has conventionally been placed in existing education and training sectors and in that context has been marked by a classical split, at least in Europe, between what is called general humanistic adult education and what is called continuing vocational education and training. Now, what workplace learning does, it's not the only thing that does it, but it's one of the important uh, places where this can happen. Workplace learning resituates adult learning it resituates it out of institutionalized contexts in classical education and training systems, repositions it into the contexts of everyday life. All adults work. Not all adults are employed. Not all adults are paid for the work they do. But all adults work. And therefore, working is an everyday context of normal people's life courses and biographies and everyday activities. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why workplace learning is an interesting topic theoretically. And these kinds of reasons are some of the reasons that inform and guide the kind of work that we've been doing since the network was founded in 2005. I can't, <laughs> what's happened? <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> okay, the, um, as you see, the network was founded in 2005 in Denmark, 
Um, I counted and I know that we have held at least eight working meetings since that time. And those working meetings have taken place in no fewer than six countries, which I think is quite an achievement for a relatively short uh, space of time. We have members from 11 countries at the moment. And in our view, not just in my view, but in our view as the network, um, we would love to have members from more countries. However, it makes sense to grow slowly and with more solidity. We have at the moment already too many European members and too few Asian members, if you put it in re relational terms. We have seven European countries involved and four Asian countries involved. Now, if you think about what was said this morning in terms of making sure that what we do in ASM LLL is an equal partnership, this means that we cannot afford to have an over-dominance of either European partners or Asian partners in the network because this will automatically lead to a dominance of particular kinds of perspectives and traditions and this is what we want to overcome. Not because we want to remove our traditions but because we want to learn from those different kinds of traditions. Um, we have managed to publish to date two edited collections. You will see those in a moment. And we are planning to conduct a joint survey uh, starting around now. We've been working to prepare this in the past few months and we will go into the field in the next few months. Now, one way of trying to describe uh, in shorthand what it is that we've been trying to do, we call our work the code project. And it's quite obvious where it comes from, competence development. Um, workplace learning is a context in which competence development of all kinds takes place. And I say of all kinds because people, when they are learning at work, and they learn at work all the time, are not only learning things about how to do their jobs better, they're also learning things about themselves. And they're also learning things about how to operate in the communities and the societies of little words. Huh? What, how, why, with what benefits, for whom, do which people learn, I could have said, in what kinds of working environments. The reason for all those little words is because the kind of learning that goes on in working life as an everyday context is inherently multidimensional. And all the information have to be taken into account to try to understand how it is people learn, what kind of things they learn, whether they enjoy it or not, and whether it makes any sense to them, their employers, or the world while they're doing it. We are interested in trying to find out what we can learn about workplace learning as competence development by making comparisons, not only between Asian countries and European countries, but amongst those countries as well. So we don't make an assumption that there is always a clear difference, a cut between what happens in Europe and how we think about it, and what happens in Asia and how we think about it. The picture is much more complex than that. There are a set of key parameters that we can apply in the kind of research that we would like to do in the future. These are only some of them, but they're probably central parameters for what it is we want to do. Firstly, something you've heard a lot about already this morning, uh, in all of the contributions so far, reference has been made to what I call the learning continuum, that is the uh, different categories which are not really categories in the sense of being cut off from each other between formal learning, non-formal learning and informal learning. 
non-formal and informal learning are probably the things that we in our network would focus on most strongly. There's a lot of research that's already been done on formal uh, continuing education training in lots of different contexts. There has not so much been done on understanding non-formal and informal learning, the similarities and the differences between the two, and what they can do and what they can't do. I've already made reference to the fact that in principle, we're interested in the full spectrum of working places. So not only those people who are working under standard kinds of employment contracts in standard kinds of organizational environments, which are in any case very heterogeneous. Even that category of the standard employment is very heterogeneous. We are also interested in educational and social trajectories. That means that we pay attention to bio biography and life course. People don't come to adult learning as if they had dropped from another planet. They have lives behind them and they have lives to come. What we can look at in our research studies are, if you like, particular moments along trajectories, along life courses. People bring sets of experiences and sets of meanings to how they think about what they do and what they do at any particular point in time. So these things are important, including, incidentally, the whole range of social inequalities in access to and participation in adult learning uh, in the workplace and indeed generally. Finally, um, learning is not only an individual activity, it is a social activity. And therefore, the context in which people learn is important. Working places are contexts. Therefore, we also need to take into account what we would call the aggregate level huh, of uh, people's learning learning that takes place in the, working, in the working space as an organization. Organizational cultures differ significantly across a whole range of different parameters that I'm not going to go into detail on now, about which we do know quite a bit already, not because we have done research on it, but because there's a big research community that has, um, but also there are different kinds of occupational cultures. Occupations where particular kinds of learning connected with work take a particular kind of form and take on a particular kind of meaning. So these kinds of parameters for us are all important in the way that we want to structure what it is we would like to do in the future. Now what we have done so far, because if you want to try to address the kinds of complex questions that I've tried to sketch out here, then you first of all have to know where you might be standing now. Um, therefore, the first thing that we did was for the countries that are actively involved in the network, or were at that time, we decided to try to conduct some reviews of what kinds of ideas and what kinds of research are available that could tell us something about the map of workplace learning uh, in the countries uh, that those of us in the network might know something about. This is the cover of the book. Uh, it sold out incredibly quickly. <laughs> um, we could have it reprinted, but I think it's probably not worth it because <laughs> if you go to the ASEM LLL website, you can now download the whole book uh, as a PDF file. So all you have to do is go to the Research Network site on the ASEM LLL Hub site and you can download the whole lot and it won't cost you anything. Uh, uh, so um, I think the fact that it did sell out so quickly and has started, I, it's quite amazing how in how many different kinds of contexts people have mentioned to me, oh yes, you did this book on this. Uh, um, so it obviously touched a key somewhere. Now for us, at the end of the day, the most important thing about this book was not the individual contributions. Interesting as, though, as they may be, 
what was really important for us at the end of the day was that it enabled us to think about the way in which the others think about these things. And it's quite obvious uh, that, let us say, in this case, there seems to be a tendency that in Europe, we tend to think about adult learning as a series of binaries, as eithers and ors. It's either one thing or it's the other. It's general education or it's vocational training, etc. Whereas in Asian countries, it's not as if these distinctions are not recognized and known about, but they don't carry the same symbolic sets of meanings. They don't carry the same kinds of oppositions that we have become accustomed to thinking about uh, in European educational uh, theoretical traditions. There's also something about the relationship between the formation of subjectivity on the one hand and the construction of the social on the other, which seems to take on quite different forms in different kinds of cultural contexts. This we need to look more closely into because these kinds of relationships have a strong bearing on how it is people think they learn, should learn, can learn, want to learn, uh, etc. It's also the case, of course, um, and you obviously can't avoid this, but many people never get any further than this, that the objective circumstances and the objective structuring of societies and economies between Europe and Asia on the one hand, but within Asia and within Europe on the other, also make an enormous difference to what it is you can do in lifelong learning policy and practice. And I was reminded very strongly of this insight from the book. Recently, I have been uh, helping to prepare the first UNESCO report on adult learning and education. And one of the things that's come out very clearly about how different countries throughout the world now, we're talking about all the UNESCO member states, so this is a lot of countries. What seems to be coming out is that lifelong learning policies and their implementation are linked quite closely with these objective circumstances, which is no more than you would expect. In other words, in the poorest countries of the world, lifelong learning is understood as basic literacy and basic skills. In countries that form into the middle bracket, and many Asian countries would fall into the middle bracket of countries, and this is going by the um, uh, development index, huh? which is largely based on economic uh, factors, then you find that human resources development becomes much more important. In the in Western countries, that is, in North America, Australia, Australia Asia, and in Europe, then you find a more integrated approach to lifelong learning in which aspects of personal and social development become much more important as well. Now, what's interesting about this distinction is that it's cumulative. It's not that you don't do basic skills and basic literacy huh? in Western Europe. You do that as well. You also do human resources development. So as you are moving through these economically linked approaches to lifelong learning, you collect more and more dimensions that are brought into lifelong learning policies uh, and the way they are implemented. And I think that uh, we have to relate some of this work to uh, what we do in the future on workplace learning. But we saw some of these things beginning to come out uh, through the reviews that we did in this book. Now, it's not always easy to travel halfway across the world eh? in either direction. <laughs> So after we had made the great effort and published the first collection, we decided that the next thing we should do is perhaps to try to have regional meetings, that is, meetings of the Asian partners and meetings of the European partners, to see if we could bring our thinking a little bit more forward in order to decide what it is we could try to do together. This book here, which I'm delighted to say, um, is hot off the press. Huh? Here it is, Milan Paul, a colleague from Masaryk University in Brno, who's sitting in the front row, brought some copies with him today. So this is our second publication. It is also available huh, 
as uh, it's, we first did it on a CD-ROM, and it's also available for download on the, on the ASM LLL site. So you can get this one as well without having to have the actual book, although it's nice to have the book. Huh? Um, here, what we did, this is a result of uh, the European Partners Seminar, which we held in Brno in 2007. And in this book, there are seven papers from five European countries in there. And if I tell you about the kind of things that are in there, you will see how some of the ideas are beginning to develop. We had from Denmark, um, two kinds of uh, analyses of organizational learning from different kinds of perspectives. Um, the first one had to do with how student nurses learn on the job in situations huh? and how they learn when they come up against situations that they don't automatically know how to resolve. In other words, problem-orientated situated learning the other chapter uh, was to think about organizational learning as a kind of a multivocality, that is, a kind of a process in which many voices are involved, but also which is triggered by uncertainties. So in other words, both of these chapters are trying to think about organizational learning as something which is very closely related to problem solving, problems that you do not know at the first glance how to resolve. Then uh, there is a chapter from the Czech Republic which is looking at how organizational learning uh, in particular kinds of contexts, working contexts, are li is linked to the company culture, how the company approaches learning, and how the personal context of the employees are implicated in that as well. So it's trying to link different S aspects uh, of multifacetedness together. Then from the UK, um, the author is sitting, or one of them is sitting right in the front row, that's Karen Evans, um, is looking at the learning continuum again, or rather in particular non-formal and informal learning within the learning conti continuum, and looking at this in relation to basic skills learning at the workplace for low qualified workers. The contribution from Austria, the author is standing in front of you, <laughs> is also about the learning continuum. Um, in this case, it's a more theoretical contribution, which is looking at how the learning continuum is helping to overcome the traditional kinds of borders and, 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 and barriers between different kinds of learning and different sectors of learning. And then there are two contributions from Hungary one of the authors is sitting in the room somewhere, Gabor, I don't know where you are, um, but he is here. And here we have reviews of different kinds of workplace learning in Hungary. Firstly, in relation to regional differences, there appear not to be as many as one would expect within the country of Hungary. And secondly, um, looking at the uh, very strong differences between approaches to adult learning in different kinds of companies. So this is related to the idea of company culture. And linking these kinds of things also to social inequalities of, of access uh, to uh, workplace learning. Having done a lot of work <laughs> in producing these, these books, we then decided uh, then we had the, um, uh, the conference, the international conference in Kuala Lumpur in 2007, and the network sat down and thought about what it had produced so far and how it might, could work further. Didn't come to a clear solution, but a year later, when we were last November in Beijing, somebody suddenly had the idea to do a joint survey, and the somebody came from one of our Asian partners, that is, the idea came from Malaysia. So, since last November, uh, we have been working together on trying to uh, develop a questionnaire, uh, which those of you who have been involved in this kind of work will know just how difficult it is to construct the kind of instrument, research instrument, 
which can be used in such different kinds of cultural contexts, such different kinds of uh, labor market structures. And not least, last but not least, with such different kinds of languages. <laughs> so we have to face all these issues uh, at the moment. Um, and to give you some idea of what the kinds of questions that are in our mind, the idea about doing the survey was to look at lifelong learning in terms of whether it is something that people choose to do voluntarily or whether it is something that people have to do and what kinds of implications does whether the learning is voluntary and from whose point of view is it voluntary and whether the learning is compulsory, what kind of impact does that have on people's learning experiences and the outcomes and the benefits of that kind of learning in the workplace. So, there is a great dis lot of discussion in uh, some parts of Europe at least about whether the concept of lifelong learning inherently implies placing an obligation on everybody to learn. In these debates, obligation is seen as something negative. So that raises the question of whether that kind of approach to the obligation to learn as part of lifelong learning, whether that is something that has a similar negative connotation in different kinds of cultures and countries, or not, and if not, why not? We know that people, however old or however young they are, they get much more out of learning if they are personally motivated uh, to do so. And when they do so, because, it li because they do it because they want to. Now, some might argue that one can be persuaded to think one wants to, <laughs> even when it's not really like that. This is, we won't get into those kind of questions today, but we know that when people want to learn, feel that they do it of their own volition, that they get more out of it. So from this point of view, what would it mean to say that workplace learning opportunities are attractive or they're unattractive? Thirdly, a lot of workplace learning is informal. That means it's not pedagogically structured. It doesn't have a specific identity or a place or a space where it says this is learning with a label on it. It happens as a natural part of everyday working processes. Given that this is the case, what, what sense can we make of the concepts of intentionality and of free will? Now, these are rather abstract questions. Huh? Uh, we think they're important because these kinds of questions inform the empirical work that you go on to do. Our research questions, I've almost finished, our research questions are here that you, uh, you see up on this slide. First of all, we want to learn more about what adults understand to be voluntary workplace learning and compulsory workplace learning. And it is quite likely that this is not a binary opposition, but is also a continuum, so that there are positions in between, most simply when somebody recommends that you should do something, but doesn't actually say you have to. So that's the first kind of thing we want to know more about. The second kind of thing, yes, I know. The second kind of thing that we want to know more about is what kinds of formal and non-formal learning uh, do campus, companies and organizations offer? Which of these offers do employees see as being uh, ob obligatory and why do they see them as being obligatory? Is it because they think they'll lose their job if they don't do it? Is it because they know that getting a promotion depends on it, etc.? Thirdly, how do, how do the answers to these kinds of questions affect employees' motivation and their satisfaction in the context of workplace learning. Those are the questions 
that we want to try to turn into an empirical study in the coming months. Our next steps, and this is my last slide, mm -hmm. we have to finalize the questionnaire. We've almost done it. We have to decide on the sampling frame. We have to decide how we're going to do the field work, whether we will do an online survey or whether we have to, at least for part of the study, do face-to-face -face questionnaire work. Most important of all, perhaps, we have to secure the resources to do it because we don't have huh, the money to do this work yet. We only have little bits and pieces. Everything until now has been voluntary. And of course, we have to think about how we want to analyze the data and publish. Now, on Wednesday, we are having a research network meeting. We would be delighted if more countries wished to join the idea of such a study and might begin to think about how they could do the field work in their countries. This means that if anybody here would like to come to the research network meeting on, on Wednesday, they are very welcome to do so. We will begin in the morning with three short papers, short research papers, and then we will move to spend most of the day on these kinds of issues. If you think you are interested and you might want to come, this doesn't mean that you will be obliged to participate afterwards. It simply means that you may be interested. So do please come along. And of course, we appreciate your support now and in the future. Thank you. <laughs>